Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Sports Legends of the Carolinas. I'm Scott Fowler, your host, and a sports columnist for the Charlotte Observer since 1994. And today, I'm delighted to have Coach Dawn Staley here with us. And, of course, Staley's five-year-old gray and white Havanese rescue dog named Champ who's become a star in his own right. Winning isn't, I score more points than you. Winning is to be able to, to, to be in a space when, when things are stacked against you and you really don't care. Your approach is, you're gonna find a way. When in doubt, go to your go-to, Don Staley. We're visiting with Coach Staley in Columbia, South Carolina. Inside the USC women's basketball offices were all sorts of rare memorabilia on display including Staley's collection of Olympic gold medals and the trophies commemorating South Carolina's national championships in 2017 and 2022. Staley, who is 52, has been the women's basketball head coach for the Gamecocks since 2008, and her teams have made the Final Four in four of the past seven NCAA women's basketball tournaments. John Staley with her national championship. God, this does not happen without without him. Before Staley made such a big impact on coaching, she grew up in Philadelphia, starred at the University of Virginia, and won three Olympic gold medals as a hard-nosed point guard on the U.S. national team. She would later coach that same team to a fourth gold medal. She was also a three-time WNBA All-Star playing for the Charlotte State. Staley puts it in. But that time they go to their key player, Dawn Staley. Dawn Staley, next on Sports Legends of the Carolinas. Welcome, Coach Staley, to the show. Thank you, Scott. I, I have to say that I've always seen your little your little profile picture on your article, so you look very familiar. But I've, I've known you since um, since um, spending some time in, uh, in Charlotte. That's right. That's right. Well, why don't we start there? Uh, I, yes, I've been there long enough, and my little two-inch picture was running in the Charlotte Observer for a long time, as you mentioned, and... Uh, long enough that I covered the WNBA when the Charlotte Sting was there, and you were one of their stars. I particularly remember the 2001 season where y'all went all the way to the championship game. Um, but there were some rough moments, certainly, for that franchise, too. What what do you remember about your, I guess it was about six years at the Charlotte Sting? Um, I, I only remember great times. Like, I only remember, like, the friendships, the locker room talk, the dinners, the um, traveling, and just really enjoying the people that I was on the team with. Like, we had an incredible relationship. Um, we didn't take ourselves too seriously. Uh, we, you know, we know each other now. And we we often, uh, times, we reminisce. I was just on a, on a podcast with um, Allison uh, Feaster. Mm -hmm. They call it Charlie down here in the South. <laughs> um, so we reminisced about, you know, a number of things. Charlotte Smith, um, she just texted me last week. I think she's putting on some type of golf tournament. So I'm going to send her some um, some items to support her. Um, and it's, I just remember, and it's not a lot about basketball, but when we do talk about basketball, we do talk about starting 1-10 and 10 and then going all the way to the WNBA championship um, series when, when everybody counted us out. But during that season – during that season, we again in the locker room, it would never feel like we were like a one in ten team. It just felt like we were going to hit our stride because we were losing probably by the basket or two or less, and we knew we had a great team. We just weren't getting the results that we wanted, but there was always time. There was always we built a a deficit of a one in ten record. It only took. You know, winning eight games to get you back in playoff contention. So we ended up, I think we ended up winning, going 17-4 and four in our last 21 right. games. Mm -hmm. Tonight, the Sparks hosting the Charlotte Sting here at Staples Center. Right, and got and won, went all the way through the playoffs and played uh, Lisa Leslie yeah, and the we, Sparks <laughs> in the final, mm -hmm. right? And tell me this, uh, because you were, I think people forget maybe how great of a player Don Staley was. As far as the Charlotte Sting, the very veteran and very dangerous Don Staley. Do you believe that you are a better player of basketball or a coach of basketball? Well, since I'm a little older, I only remember the coaching. Right? So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, I'm, I'm probably a better coach um, because I, I would say I've always been a coach even when I was playing. Just my, my position um, demands for me to, to do coaching type things. Um, and I think I utilized my playing days to be a better coach now that I'm a, a coach. And I, I, I do feel like when I was a player, I, I only got a chance to um, impact and be impacted by a small group of people on a team. Um, as a coach now, I, I get the impact. I get the impact my current players, my former players, um, the entire women's basketball community. So I think my my impact is a little bit bigger, and my you know my gratitude is a lot larger because it's you know I get to connect with so many different people. I uh, on another subject, I have a nephew that just moved to Philadelphia. And he knows nothing about Philadelphia, so I I said, well, I'm gonna I'm about to interview somebody who's from Philadelphia, and so I'm gonna ask her just sort of to describe it to someone who's not been there before. And you're, and I know you've sometimes made a differentiation. I believe in your interviews from North Philly. Sometimes you say North Philly. So what what does that mean? <laughs> Tell nephew to stay away from North Philly. <laughs> no, okay. I mean I, I am from North. I'm from the projects of North Philly. Temple University is in North Philly. Um, Philly is a, I mean, it's a, it's a blue collar town. Like, um, you, you, you just stay in, in your lane. I, it's the, it's the best way that I can describe it. Like if you, um, if, if you are hardworking, you're going to love Philly. Um, if you love great restaurants and great landmarks and walking around and different, you know, different, um, um, landmarks. History, Your, yeah. The history of Philly mm-hmm. is is awesome. I mean, there are some tucked away places. If you love cheesesteaks, you're gonna love it. Um, it's it's just Philly's a big city, so there's it's, it's crime in Philly. We we got we got it all. We got the whole spectrum of living life, and that's the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, but if he can find a way to carve out all that's good in Philly. He he's going to enjoy it. He's going to enjoy it so much that he'll he'll probably want to stay and live there. Hmm. Every every like player that we got to commit the temple and their parents, they were a little you know put off by the you know the movement of Philly. The I mean it is exciting. It is you know there's a lot of people. There's a lot of things to get into. But once they settled in, they they found jobs there. They live there now and they they really enjoy it. What does it mean when a when you say a player is from Philly or has that Philly mentality? People, I, I think you've said that about yourself before. What does that mean? Yeah, it, it just means that um, we're ones that persevere. Like we're gonna find a way um, to win, and winning isn't I score more points than you. Winning is to be able to 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 be in a space when when things are stacked against you and you don't care like you really don't care your approach is you're going to find a way and you're going to find a way to 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 be satisfied with with whatever it's a performance be satisfied with the work that you put into something and it it doesn't mean the results are going to be picture perfect it's just what you put into it and most times Philly people are very passionate about what they what they give their time to, and if they give their time to something, you you got all of them. I remember it was when you were with the Sting that you then became Temple's head coach, which was remarkable. It's still, even now, speaking of hard work, and I don't understand how you did it really. <laughs> like, how did you do that? You were Temple's head women's basketball coach and a full time WNBA player. Um, I, I wanted to do it. I think when people want to do something, they prioritize. So, you know, I'm not one that really has a a, a huge social life. So the, the part of my social life that I would have had, you know, I'm probably working out. I'm probably my head is somewhere in 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 the game. Um, I mean, it's, it's easy once you have people around you that really understand what you're trying to do. Um, and Temple 
wanted to take that chance on on me continuing my my professional basketball career and me coaching. You know, obviously they saw something in me that I probably didn't see in myself and that um I'm probably the the ultimate cart part mentalizer cuz you have to be. You, you have to be. Um so I we just hired some great people that understood it that were able to take care of things when I was away for 4 or 5 months of the of the year. You know, but but it's doable because it's basketball and instead of me having to go out and recruit, go on the road to recruit the recruits, we all we always say come see come see our coach uh, playing in the WNBA because ultimately that's what they wanted to do. We'll be back right after this. Welcome back. So has your style evolved as a coach from Temple to, you know, 15, 20 years later now? I mean, and if so, how? Oh, my my former players from Temple, they call me Charmin. Like, <laughs> like I'm soft now. Like I'm, <laughs> now you're soft? I'm soft. Oh, I I'm see. Soft. They, they caught the hard Yeah, part. they caught the hard. Okay. I had a lot of energy when I was 30 years old. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I think in in any profession, you're you're gonna you you know people evolve, you know uh, young people are different, um, parents are different, so you you got to be able to pivot. There are, you know, the core principle of who I am as a coach is still the same. Like it's very much the same in how I see basketball. It's just how I deal with people is a little bit different, you know. Um, I was more probably um, less censored in my yeah. younger years. <laughs> I'm more censored, and it, it, I have to explain myself a lot more. I have to really understand who people are, and not, and I have to be conscious of confidence levels, and I also have to be conscious of parents who they – like my parents didn't mind me failing, like because they know there are so many life lessons packed into that. Parents nowadays they don't want their their children to fail, and it almost hurts them hmm. because you they're not living in a place where everything's going to be perfect and great. Like, and I often tell, um, I often tell our, my my players that I love them enough. To allow them to fail, and I'm a, and I tell them don't measure me by how your parents love you, because I have a different type of love. I got a tough love, I got a love of, of, I got a way of of showing you love that will hopefully create longevity in, in basketball and in life, mm-hmm. um, because it's not going to be perfect. You're you're going to be challenged. Physically, mentally, spiritually, all those things you're going to be challenged, and if you're not, if you're not prepared to pivot, and prepared to go a little bit deeper than you know what's on the surface, they're they're they're, they're like it's too competitive out here. It's too competitive to you got to outfox people. People, you got to be you got to think like the game, a, a player two or three ahead of the game, and that's you got to think that way in life. And along the way, you're going to fail. Like you're you're gonna you're gonna have a bad game. You're gonna have a bad. You might have a bad week. You might have a bad month. You might have a bad season. How do you how do you come back from that? How do you continue to get up and do that? You know, do what you do, knowing that you're not getting the results you want. So, and you you need people that that have been there. Like you, gotta, I've been there. I've navigated through injuries. I've navigated through losing seasons. I've navigated through. Uh, all of it, and you know, I I'm a I'm a testament to Survivor. it. Survivor, yeah. yeah. So you've talked about uh, it's important to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Oh, I absolutely. think is what you're saying. Yeah, right. But there's... yeah, you got to embrace it. Like I don't like everything about my job. I don't like yeah. everything like about what? my job. Um, doing this I interview. Don't... <laughs> <laughs> no, I I don't mind doing interviews once I'm in it. Um, because it is sharing my story is sharing. I, I know people are dealing with things that, you know, they, you know, things that they don't think I'm dealing with. 
What what don't I like about the job? I I don't I don't like recruiting. Um uh, because I really haven't again, I'm I'm censored but I'm not like like I don't I can't fluff it up. Mm. Like I haven't You're honest. You've always been that way. Yeah, like I can't I'm I'm like I'll give you the worst case scenario and I, a lot of times people don't want to hear that. They want to hear the fluff like what like at the end of my 4 years you know, I want to be a first round draft pick. I want to be a lottery pick. Well, I, I, I really, that's really out of my pay grade. And it's, you know, I can only help you prepare for the next level. I can't tell GMs and coaches to, you know, to draft, to, to draft my, my kids, you know, if you got the top pick, the work, the work comes before the draft. And, um, and a lot of times, you know, young people don't know, like, you know, you could, you could be drafted, you could be drafted 20th, um, uh, but you could have a incredibly long career because that, that team fits your style a lot better, or you can go the number two pick and it's not, it's not for you. It's not your style of play and be gone in a year or two starting that. And I, there's no way to, you know, the money's a, the money's a little different to the 20, but over the course of an entire career, 20 might be the, you know, the 10 year career. Right. Sure. So it's hard to, you know, it's hard to say that without, um, bursting someone's dream. Sure. But I got to give it to them because it could very well be what happens. Right. The worst case scenario is a, I think a phrase you've used before too. That that's you're just going to be authentic with people. I have. I, I don't know any other way. Yeah. Like I really don't know any other way. I'm, I'm a, I'm a protector of my peace. So I give people, you know, me. Mm-hmm. Some people like it. Some people don't. But I think at the end of the day, um. You you at least know where I'm coming from, and that's a that's a good place to be. Absolutely, as a receiver, as a receiver. Mm-hmm. Speaking of recruiting, I wrote a column about a month or two ago when the Charlotte Hornets <laughs> were looking for a. I read that. You saw uh-huh. that, <laughs> and I really believed it. And I, I my theory was that Don Staley would be the perfect next coach for the Charlotte Hornets. Um, I know you've signed a enormous deal here, seven year deal, and. I wasn't trying to lure you away. I just wanted to put that out there because I think you could do it and do a great job. But you don't recruit in the NBA, except for free agents, I guess, <laughs> or the WNBA. So does the professional game interest you? No, it, it never it never has. And I don't know why, because I'm I'm one that, you know, I, I look for the next challenge. But to me that really that that isn't a challenge for me. I, I actually, it doesn't like, like, like never, like even when I was playing in the WNBA, um, I never wanted to, I never wanted to be Ann Donovan. I never wanted to be Trudy Lacey. I never wanted to be them like ever. Like, um, I, my passion is for young people. Okay. And I, I, I would say that both leagues are getting younger and younger. Um, but I'm getting older and older and, I, I more so see the light at the end of the tunnel in my career and going to the next level from an NBA standpoint, it, it's, it takes a long time to be successful. Uh, I'm not afraid of it at all. Um, I, I think the root of, of being successful in any league is your ability to connect with the players. And, and I, I don't have an issue with that. You know, I know basketball. I don't think basketball changes a whole, whole lot. I think it's the people and who you connect with that, you know, if you can bring the best out of of individuals and they see and they feel it, that's the trick. And then, and then if everybody's feels the same way, they, they're only going to want to win because they're, they're satisfied with how, you know, how their career is progressing. You've won two national championships here already, and in one of the final four interviews this year, I believe you were speaking about Connecticut, and you were like, well, I'm not going to get to 11 because I'm not going to be here that long. And then another time you said, well, I'm not going to be here when I was 
68. Somebody was 68. Maybe it was Gina. Um, but so you're Tara 50. 60, Tara, Tara 69, I maybe believe. Maybe it was that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, so you're 52 now. So how long do you see yourself doing it? I don't, I, I don't see myself at 60. Really? Yeah. Yeah. But I didn't see myself coaching either. And now <laughs> right. this is my yeah. 23rd year. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I, I'm enjoying it. Like, and I can say this and I'm enjoying it. Like I, I don't see myself coaching at 60. Um, but if I if I if I get some more classes like like we've had, you know, the job is a little easier because there there's certain parts of of it that I don't have to deal with. Like I got gr- great players and great people. I don't have to deal with knuckleheads. Like I don't have to deal I don't have an issue dealing with them, but when when the teams that I've had over the past couple of years, when they just want to win, they just want to win. They just want to be great. A spectacular performance, and South Carolina has won the national championship. Um, they just want to be pros. Like, that is probably the perfect scenario for me because sure. that's why I want to get into coaching. I want to change generations through playing the game. I think Dawn is the most important young coach in the country. She's a high-level recruiter. She's the United States Olympic coach, somebody who's ready to raise their level and continue to roll like Dawn has done. And the players that I have approach it that way, and it's 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 been great. It's been great, so... If our assistant coaches could get some more number one recruiting classes, I might I might stick around. <laughs> <laughs> You've tried very intentionally, it seems like, to elevate women's basketball as a sport. And, and one of the most public examples, and I think one of the coolest examples, was what you did with the 2017 net and why you were inspired and I know some of that story but I hope you would tell it for us today as to why you did that yeah well um two years before we won our our national championship in 2017 Carolyn Peck who was the first black coach female coach to win a national championship in 1999 um she was um an analyst doing some of our games a lot of our games and she pulled me to the side, wanted to shoot around, and she told me the story about um, one of one of her teammates gave her a piece of her national championship net. I think back, it was a like a, I don't, Tennessee, maybe she went to Tennessee, a good friend of hers, and she thought that paying it forward in this way and giving me a piece of piece of her nineteen ninety nine national championship net would be the perfect way that um, someone giving her their piece of the net and how it impacted her and how she was able to give it back. That was the most important thing. And she said, once you win your national championship, I just want you to return it to me and then pay it forward to someone else, another coach. And it took me probably another two years to figure out who I should give it to. And I actually wanted her to help me find that person because she was pretty good at it. She found me. Right. Um, but we could never come to a, you know, a, a, a good conclusion on who we would bestow it on. So I was doing an interview and, and the, uh, the reporter asked me, had I given my piece of the net away yet? And I was like, no, I really I can't find the person to do it. Um, and then I just thought about sharing it with other uh, black coaches on the Division One level because I know the struggle and I know um, what that little piece of nine line, what hope it brought to them, and and I knew that everyone, every one of them would not win a national championship, but their national championship is maybe um, being a part of a first generation graduate on their team. Uh, maybe they needed some hope and and. And everyday life and dealing with young people and parents and all of that. And if they can look and feel that piece of nylon and and have the energy uh, to to hurdle, you know, some of the obstacles that 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 they're faced with, that's that's to me is a national championship like um, honor and award and celebration and all of those things. So I I thought it was uh, 
thought it was a great connection piece um, for 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 black coaches. And you and so that was sent to dozens of people, I guess, in the in the about West. seventy, about seventy, about seventy coaches. Seventy. Wow. And I'm, I may have missed one or two. They were quick to remind me that <laughs> I, <laughs> I need sure. to keep cutting. <laughs> <laughs> you you really spliced that net up into a lot of different pieces. That's great, and 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 shared it out to the world. And so, what are you going to do with the 2022 net? Have you decided yet? Yeah, yeah, I, I did. I haven't yet, though. It, it it takes me a little bit of time to, to figure out, you know, uh, the, the group. So I am going to give it to black journalists um, because their journey is um, similar. Like there are not a lot of black journalists in this space. And I want to lend some hope and some um, just really hope that that they can, because uh, if they love up on um, this space, like I love up on basketball, you know, the sky is the limit. And sometimes you just need a little push every now and then to say, keep going. If you want this, keep going, even when the, you know, the odds are stacked against you. Well, have you gotten another dog? I know Champ, who's, who's sitting on the couch beside us while we're doing this interview, uh, came from the national championship in 17, right? And, Indeed. Yeah, and does he, what does he think about a possible uh, new dog in the Staley household, or is that, is that gonna happen or no? He looks Champ, very calm Champ, right now. Champ said a hard no. <laughs> Like it's a hard no, a hard no, and I I do think another, you know I do think another dog would would help him, shape him a little bit better. But he's he's he suffers from the only child syndrome, mm. and I don't think at I mean he'll be five in October, so I, I don't think he's uh, willing to give up his space in the household or or on the bed at night. So no, I, I'm not gonna do that. And I I travel a whole lot, so it's it's a lot, you know. It's a lot to ask someone to to watch two dogs, but they're also these, you know, these places that treat them really really good. I haven't tried them yet because there's so many people that lined up to to watch Champ. Does he understand that he's a dog? He no, seems to, yeah, not at all, <laughs> not at all. But I it's it's probably because of how I treat him, like <laughs> like my sister. She always ask, uh, like, you know, if I if I have a if I have a speaking engagement, sometimes I'll take Champ, and she'll ask me, "Is Champ going?" I said, "Am I going?" Like, <laughs> like he goes like to a lot of places, and honestly, uh, people don't see me anymore, and they they just see Champ, and they just gravitate to, towards Champ. Yeah, yeah, dogs are. We have two, and they're just wonderful. Uh, companions yes, right they are i mean i've have you seen that bumper sticker ever that says i just want to be the person my dog thinks i am or whatever <laughs> right, you know? right yeah i mean because they are just like you talk about unconditional love it does not matter if you lost does not matter had a bad day but i don't need stuff. i don't know my life like i don't know what my life was like before him really seriously like it's really? just yeah. Did y'all grow up with i, I know you no, were one I don't of five like children dogs. right Did i don't like dogs i just like shit. oh you don't like dogs Okay. So, <laughs> like I'm yeah, afraid of dogs. That. I'm afraid that of dogs. Really, oh, yeah. I, I am. I, I've gotten bitten by a dog in my, oh. you know, my childhood. So I'm really? always like, Ugh. yeah. Uh. Well, how I got Champ is, um, my my niece who was living with me at the time, um, she told me one of her friends asked her if she would watch a seven week old puppy, mm. right? Mm-hmm. It's the cutest thing, cutest Ace. <laughs> Ace was his name, and I used to walk by Ace in the in the garage, in his crate, and I I didn't say anything to him. I didn't, you know, I would say hi, but I would just keep going. I wouldn't interact with him because I know me. <laughs> so I started feeling bad that you know she couldn't bring him in the house because I'm allergic, and then you know it's months. Yeah. You were talking about Christmas, and then. He's still at the house in May, so I'm like, we we gotta go get him his shots. We gotta we gotta go, you know. So I um I started playing with them, and I was like, let's let's go, let's take him. So I ended up taking him to get his shots, and then he got neutered. And then um, the weekend that he got neutered, he started shaking. So I'm like, you know, this isn't this isn't right. So I'm taking the dog to the emergency room, and um, they said he was a little dehydrated. 
Um, so I got all of that. You know, that is, that is, I should have, I should have got into, you know, pet care, care yeah. taking care of pets. That's when you need that new yes. contract. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so they filled them with antibiotics and um, took them home. And then for 10 days, he was good on the antibiotics. And then, you know, one, one day my sister had him and he was, he had a drunken walk. Oh, yeah. So she was like, something's wrong with Ace. So I scooped him up, took him back, and I told him something's wrong. And they actually had me leave him and do some testing. And I was like, yeah, do whatever you need to do to, you know, save his life or whatever. So they called me and they were like, he's got some kind of, you know, white matter in his brain. And they said that type of dog early on, they're susceptible to, you know, you know, brain injuries. And so they said, but we share the parking lot with a neurologist. So took them over. Um, and they basically said, get these items. These, there's a possibility that you can, you know, you, you can uh, reverse it. But we tried for like a month. And oh, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that, like, my nephew just showed me pictures of Ace. And we talked about that dreaded day that we had to take him and, 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 yeah, I mean, it was the worst. Like, I don't think I've cried like that ever, like ever, you know, for a young, for a young, he was six months. Oh, so it was just it was, wrenching. Oh, yes. Yeah. So Coach Boyer in our office, who's been with me for 20 years now, thought it, thought it would be great that I get a dog, but she saw how much I cared for, Ace. for Ace. Oh, yeah. So. Good, a good thing came out of it. Oh, that's yep. nice. Yeah, that's. Yes. They're part of the family, they aren't are. they? Well, last thing, um, let's just talk, I guess, a little bit about this season. And I mean, you guys will go back in as uh, defending national champions, a, a wonderful team with you. How do you sort of deal with that? You've had to do it before. I mean, same same thing. I, I, we have players who just want to win, like. They have an insatiable desire to to win. Like they they've had they've had a I would say you know the 2019 class. You know they they've had a lot of heartbreak in their careers. You know the pandemic ended in their first freshman year. We were number one team in the country. They lost in the semifinals in the final four in a heartbreaking way. They go on and win. I think they want to balance out their careers and winning another one. I mean, it's the same thing. I don't think you, I don't think we change our approach to it. I, I would say this as coaches, we got to find a way to keep them engaged and challenged. So we're, we're just trying to keep them challenged because we, we do the same thing for, for 22 years. We've approached it the same way, putting our defense in and just from, from the ground up, just working out. We're, we're probably leaning out from an offensive standpoint where we were figuring out what we were good at offensively um, and where we need to get better at. Like, I do think we need to get better in transition. We didn't, we didn't do that. So we're concentrating on areas where we weren't, where we weren't great and, and try to become great because it's, it's virtually the same team. And, I mean, they want to win. any longer South Carolina has captured its second national championship they, they want to win so yes our our, our fans are going to want us to win every single game hey, I, I like our fans because they're more like Philly fans like really? yeah it's a lifestyle like it's a it's a life when the Sixers didn't didn't win the NBA championship we're we're mad <laughs> We're mad. I know we yeah. were injured, but we're mad. You know, same thing with the Eagles. Like, oh my God, talk radio. We don't win on Sundays. Oh, it's brutal. End of the world. Yeah, end of the world. Mm -hmm. So our fans are like, like that, and I, I don't mind it because it puts a little pressure on us to perform at a high level. But also, it's a lifestyle for them. It's, a, it's really they want to know when we play. They want to know the schedule early because they have to take. Take time out of work. They gotta buy season tickets. They gotta, they gotta do, they gotta. It's it's a big part of their life's pie, and I I think that's super cool. So, um, 
anytime that we can win and win championships, they win. We we should point out that you're you have led the country in attendance for eight years in a row. Twelve thousand two hundred and sixty eight was your average attendance last year. What what did y'all draw when you played at Virginia, like roughly for a college game? I mean, we we were pretty good at the end of my career. We right. were we were we were probably around eight thousand. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. A five six sophomore from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, number twenty four, Don Staley. Because you've played in a lot of arenas where there's not that sort of support. Oh yes, right. Yeah, and it's actually a disadvantage when we go on the road and there's not a lot of people. So mm -hmm. we have to adjust. <laughs> no, really. Yeah. Yes, just yeah. like people have to adjust to having playing in front of a big crowd so um it's cool though I don't you know I don't I I am not responsible for the attendance record our our fans are responsible sure for that because when I came here I never I never looked at the crowd I never looked at like oh, I want to fill this arena I never mm. said that mm -hmm. I never visualized it I, I just wanted to win a national championship and I didn't really know what that looked like because I had never won a national championship Don Staley. Oh, geez. How did she put that ball in? Right, right, <laughs> now right. I know, though. Yeah, twice. And I know yeah. that everybody can't win one. Mm -hmm. Seriously, everybody. You know, unless you've won one and you, you've been through it, you know. But when you start the season off and say, I want to, let's go win a national championship, it's much, much harder than, than – verbalizing it. <laughs> yes, actually doing it. That is one of the most glittering athletic resumes we have seen anybody produce in this country. Not just in basketball, in this country. And I don't think this will be the end of our national championships. Perhaps just the beginning for South Carolina. Well, this has been a wonderful conversation, Coach. Uh, that's Coach Don Staley. This is Sports Legends of the Carolinas. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for listening to Sports Legends of the Carolinas, a production of the Charlotte Observer. This show is produced by Lou May Ali Sally, Jeff Siner, and Cotta Stevens. The sports editor of the Charlotte Observer is Lydia Craver. The executive editor is Raina Cash. If you know a sports fan, we've got a great gift idea for you. We've compiled the first two seasons of the Sports Legends interviews into a coffee table book, which includes more than 100 rare photos. Among the 33 legends in the book are Steph Curry, Roy Williams, Mike Krzyzewski, Dale Earnhardt Jr., Steve Spurrier, Jake DeLome, and Don Staley. The first printing sold out quickly, but the book is back in stock now, and you can order a copy at sportslegendsbook.com. For lots more sports content, please visit charlotteobserver.com and consider a digital subscription. You can connect with me, Scott Fowler, by email at sfowler at charlotteobserver.com. Please subscribe, rate, and review the Sports Legends of the Carolinas podcast. Thanks for spending some time with us, and we'll see you next time.